This episode of the Seniors Flourish podcast is brought to you by the Learning Lab membership because I get it. I was working with older adults in home health when I started out and I was the only OT practitioner. I was new, I had no mentorship, I struggled with the little things at work and I was so incredibly overwhelmed. I was struggling to keep up with that paperwork and because I was working such ridiculously long hours trying to research best practice, find all the patient handouts I needed, I just couldn't keep up with it all. And the worst part is I was constantly doubting myself. Am I really doing what's best for my new patients? That's why I created the Learning Lab because I desperately needed a way to get organized and have everything I needed at my fingertips. So it's cheaper than a textbook, but it has hundreds of treatment idea videos, patient handouts, evidence-based resources, and more right at your fingertips when you need it. So join today at SeniorsFlourish.com backslash Learning Lab. Welcome to the Seniors Flourish podcast, where it's all about helping occupational therapy practitioners disrupt the norm by throwing away the rainbow art and being the best you can be when working with older adults. Welcome everyone to the Seniors Flourish podcast. My name is Manny Chamberlain. I'm an occupational therapist and I always like to talk about everything having to do with working with older adults, occupational therapy, professional issues. Um, and today is one of those topics. I'm we, blah, 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 my guess <laughs> today um, are, are Sarah Lyons. She's from otpotential.com and Meredith Kasson. She's a physical therapist from nonclinicalpt.com. And we are going to be talking about um, non-traditional occupational therapy dro- jobs. So this is a great topic. I get questions about this all the time, even though like I typically talk about older adults, but it's just a professional issue that's kind of a hot topic. And so it's going to be really neat to talk about how we can use our OT skills in other ways um, to serve um, patients, people, and feel successful in your own practice um, in a non-traditional way. So welcome, Sarah and Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. (laughs) This is going to be so fun. (laughs) Yes, yes. Well, let's just kind of get started and we'll just talk about your journeys into working in OT and PT. Awesome. I'll go first. Um, I, as Mandy said, I'm Sarah Lyon and I run OT Potential. And do you want like back to the very beginning? Oh, you know, you know, you can do it however you want. Okay. Um, (laughs) I discovered occupational therapy at Uh, In college, I was an economics and religion major, um, but also really interested in healthcare. And I was just drawn to occupational therapy because of its holistic lens. I was really interested in um, like what motivates people and um, helping people through a hard time in their life. So I discovered occupational therapy and loved it. And right away discovered in myself a passion for making resources for fellow OTs. So I started OT Potential pretty early in my career, even as I was working full-time in acute care and mental health um, and in a small hospital, and it's just grown since then. So now I am um, part-time, full-time kind of (laughs) working on uh, just my website, OT Potential. Wow. Economics to OT, that's a good... Yeah. That's a big jump. Have you had anyone else with that? <laughs> no. Are there others? Okay. I've never met anyone. Not saying they're not out there, but I haven't had any yes. guests. It's usually like psychology or social work or, you know, not always, but yes. um, kind of those things. Economics, religion. Wow. That's, I love those stories. Gosh. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks for joining well, me today. Me if you had that same career path. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> for sure. That's crazy. <laughs> How about you, Meredith? Um, yeah. So, so I started kind of similar to Sarah in the sense that I wasn't I wasn't thinking about physical therapy when I went into college and I started out as a communications actually backing up I started out as pre-dental and then decided that I didn't want to be a dentist because I didn't want to spend my life in people's mouths no, you know. and <laughs> and then ended up graduating as a communications major and realized that I just really liked kind of design and art and things like that and so that was my first career as a graphic designer and web designer and then I went back and became a PT because I realized that sitting in front of a computer 
was as we were chatting kind of before the show, I don't do well with hours and hours and hours and hours of no human contact just sitting in front of a computer. So I just magically decided after I had a back injury and made this miraculous recovery in PT, I decided that I wanted to be a PT. And I really enjoyed it for maybe probably about a year and a half. And then started, there were there were moments during school that I wasn't loving it, but I thought, oh, it's just because I'm a student and then loved it for about a year and a half when I first got out. And then and then I just found, oh, I don't think I can do this long, long term. And so that was kind of what brought me to having my website, although there's a whole bunch of other stuff in there. I started new grad physical therapy with a, with a coworker and had a whole kind of writing career that I actually write for Sarah for OT Potential as one of my freelance gigs. And then I also write for WebPT. But that was a really, really short version of how that all happened. But it was it was all born from about three years into practice. I was going, oh, I don't think I can do this physically or even emotionally my whole life. So I have to find something else. And so I kind of landed on writing and, and the non-clinical uh, the non-clinical PT was the result of so many people reaching out to me once I became a writer. They were just saying, oh, how did you leave patient care? How did you launch your writing career? What else can I do? And so I started the site to help people answer those questions. Wow. See, and, you know, we're all <laughs> non-traditional um, therapists anyway, right? So, like, we all yes. technically all have non-traditional therapy jobs, you know, between a, a podcast, like, finding the bridge between podcasting, membership sites, websites, writing, and finding that connection between all of that is kind of crazy, but th there's there's opportunity out there. That's why we're going to be talking about that. So let's talk a little bit about what is, what? how would you classify, like what is non-traditional OT work? Like what is that? What does that look like when people are kind of like starting to look at other options? Yeah, we really had to dial that in. We Meredith and I worked together to write a blog post uh, called Your Guide to Non-Traditional OTs. So um, this is stuff that her and I have hashed out together. And we kind of narrowed in on a definition where um, for us, what we focused on was career paths where you um, are still using your skill set um, that you gained as a therapist in a role where you're not actually um, doing that patient care. Because um, some, there are kind of like those outliers who are like, I was an OT and then I became a flute player. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Something so totally those, different, right? Yes. Yeah. So we kind of focused on things that are still kind of in the realm of healthcare. Um, where OT kind of sets you up for that yeah. um, to make that transition, even yeah. though those flute players are awesome. And <laughs> that'd be a good blog post too. Definitely. <laughs> I also get asked, does telehealth count as non-clinical? And even though technically you are still delivering patient care, we when we were talking about the definition of, of what is non-clinical technically, mm -hmm. I consider telehealth to count because you're not delivering direct patient care in a setting that you would consider traditional. So you're not using your hands, you're not using your body. And that is what, at least personally, I've found is one of the main drivers for people looking for a change. It's sometimes people just aren't feeling satisfied or they're kind of bored or they're they're feeling a glass ceiling or any of those reasons. But in a lot of cases, it's a physical feeling of burnout. And so that's why so many people are interested in telehealth because they say, oh, well, it's, it's physical burnout. It's just my neck hurts all the time or my back hurts or I have rheumatoid arthritis or all these different reasons. And so telehealth for them is this great solution where they can still use 100% use their skill set and not even feel like, oh, I'm kind of using it. They're, they're using it every day. So. Mm -hmm. Speaking of yeah, I'd be interested what percentage are the, of people who pursue non-traditional work are. seems like a lot of people um, – it is people who just like physically can't do the job anymore or foresee that in their future. Um, so have this strong drive to keep using their skill set, but use it in a different way. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Is, um, is like, uh, is tele when I think of tele telehealth currently, is it mostly, I think it's mostly pediatrics. Is that pretty accurate or is that expanding to other areas? I would say that's very accurate. Um, 
I think we list out like seven telehealth providers around the country. And um, I think that they're all pediatric, but um, definitely Meredith and I were just at a conference about trends in healthcare. um, And I would bet my car something (laughs) substantial (laughs) that um, we'll see an expansion um, into serving older adults and also in mental health services, which is a great oh, yeah. uh, fit for OTs. Yes, I can. I could definitely see that happening. And I, I do want to just add from a PT. I know this is an OT podcast, but oh, that's okay. from a PT perspective, yeah. um, I've actually noticed the opposite. Whereas with with speech speech language pathology and occupational therapy, hundred percent, it's the majority is early intervention and pediatrics and things like that. But For PT, I've noticed far more companies doing adult rehab. Mm. And I think because the approach, it all comes down, if you think about it, in a lot of ways to marketing. And so with PT, we've got these things that they call PT deserts. And so there are parts of the country where where people can't get access to PT, even though they might desperately need it because it's so rural or Mm -hmm. um, that type of thing. And so that's why I think a lot of these companies have, have popped and they are they're specifically marketing themselves as a solution to the PT desert problem. So it's really interesting to see how the different the different professions have sort of taken their own approach to how everything's going to work. And then the other thing to keep in mind with telehealth is that Medicare currently doesn't reimburse for OT or PT. I'm not sure about speech pathology, but they don't reimburse for our services. And so that could be why a lot of OT and SLP companies are going for the pediatric population. And so it's going to be interesting to see what happens with PTs being that it's sprung up more in the adult population, because I think that they're going to run into issues where it's the same issues where you can't charge cash for a Medicare patient with an older adult. Yeah. And if you're charging cash for telehealth, it'll probably end up being some of the same reasons. Or some of the same issues, I should say. Yeah. Yeah, I could definitely see that. It's it, it, it's just going to grow. I think it's just one of those things. I think it'll it, it'll be interesting. Like, I'm excited to kind of see where it kind of takes us in the future. Yeah. Um, so, and it's needed. Oh, uh, I know. Just I like know. being in a rural area. Like we, there are so many services we need here that we just don't have access to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think. It's just the the growth that they'll do. They, you know, are starting things with, you know, using physicians in telehealth as well. And so I think it'll just kind of expand. I'm always kind of intrigued with like how you would do certain types of, quote, diagnoses. I mean, you can educate, but without the hands-on approach. Um, I know with like pediatrics, I know some people that have done pediatric cell health and, you know, they have the parent is there and with the child and the parent is responsible for doing certain X, Y, and Z. And so it's a whole different dynamic, but if they're doing a PT, I mean, there's no reason why we can't an OT. So maybe (laughs) non-traditional OT job. (laughs) No, Meredith, isn't there like a push to do evals in person and then do the rest telehealth? Uh, yeah. or, or that's like one model that I feel like is popular. And yeah, that that's solves okay. what Mandy's talking about there. Yes, mm-hmm. or yeah. maybe not solves, but helps with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's definitely a does definitely a model. I would say to say there's a push. I wouldn't. I don't know the answer to that, but I don't. Yeah. I know that there's a lot. There are a lot of people using that model, and in fact, one of the companies I can't say which one, but one of the companies I know. I had asked them about some of the interview questions they asked to candidates. And one of the interview questions they ask is what, what would you, or let me, let me phrase, basically what tell you that you need to put, that you need to refer someone for an inpatient eval. And so I think that they're, it's possible they're going to do an initial eval over, it's kind of like a screen almost, mm. but they'll do that over teletherapy, telehealth. And then the person will kind of be triaged where they say, okay, this is a really simple ankle sprain. We can just treat you remotely the whole time. Or they'll say, Ooh, this actually sounds like this could be more neurologically based. You might need to go in and get some, um, some skin tests, skin, skin pricking, things like that. Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. That's a good mm-hmm. way to do it. I just haven't explored that, honestly. So let's let's kind of like uh, transition. So we're going to be talking a little bit about how to determine if like non-traditional roles are for you and then kind of talking about like what are some examples of job opportunities out there. So how would you assess your situation? How would you see if non-traditional is work 
is right for you. So we're talking non-traditional as in like you were saying, Sarah, like using your therapy skills and your education in a different way versus becoming a flute player. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so how, oh. would, how would you start with that? Uh, I can I can take this. Yeah, let me just. Yeah. Um, so basically, whenever I work with people, because I have people were reaching out all the time, and usually they say it's it's something along the lines of I'm burned out, I can't stand my job, or I'm bored. One of those things. Mm -hmm. And help. What do I do? And so I don't ever want to just assume that somebody should take a non clinical role because you know, a good percentage of the time, these people are fresh out of school. And so we all know what it's like to be a new grad and yes. feel like you're just not very good. And so part of the reason that you're having trouble meeting productivity or part of the reason maybe that you're feeling burned out and crazy and spent at the end of the day is that you just need to learn a little bit more or you need more practice with different types of patients or you need, in, in many cases, it's that you need to try a different setting or you need to try a different manager. And in fact, mm -hmm. I would say more important than setting would be management because yes. the manager's job. Yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the manager, uh, makes or breaks it. They can make oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. So that's that's usually what I try to get into with people, and it depends on how they contact me, whether they come in through co through coaching, formal coaching, or they just kind of email me or, or talk to me on Facebook. But I try to work with them and identify whether they truly dislike patient care and even if they dislike patient care are they actually ready for the the kind of change that takes them away from it because i don't want to send somebody away from patient care if they are not truly ready to leave because then it getting back into it can be even more challenging if you leave too soon because mm -hmm. you you forget everything mm -hmm. and so basically that's kind of what i do first is it's almost like uh, to use the term again triaging but then I will give people when they want to do some formal coaching and say what's next then I give them a series of tests so I do one of them is the form that I sent you the love hate easy hard assessment which mm -hmm. just kind of shows what they're good at what they're not so good at what they enjoy and what they can't stand different job kind of performance and task elements and then there's a values assessment and then I have them take a couple of online personality tests and then take all that information and then share these. I have about 14 right now that are that are completely researched and ready to go as far as what you need to get there, what additional education, if any, how you need to format your resume, what types of things you need. But I basically just take the results from that first exploration, the set of exploration exercises where you're you're really exploring what do you want out of life. That's the most important thing and I left it out. But yes. the first thing I always <laughs> well is um is what do you want out of your life because unless you're unless you're a very rare type of person who truly your only passion in life is your job, then your work <laughs> really should support your life. You know, you yeah. you have family maybe, you have parents, friends, community, pets, whatever else, travel, but everybody's got reasons that they live and everybody's got reasons they want to make money. And so that's what I try to get people to identify as well through all these different batteries of tests is what, what are you trying to support with your career? Because there are a lot of roles out there that sound so awesome. And for example, sales or clinical trainer are these wonderful roles where you're, you're out traveling a lot and they're exciting and you meet new people and you get to present and you get to grow and you get a lot of financial growth and reward but then if your number one priority is your children, then you're not going to want to take a traveling sales role. It's, it's one thing to take it when you're 22 and maybe don't have your kids yet, that type of thing. But mm -hmm. if you're, if you do have some kids, you probably don't want to take a sales role unless you have a partner who really wants to be alone all the time with their yeah. kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, and I'll have to say, even for me, like one of the reasons I started, you know, Seniors Flourish um, was because I had kids at home and I was like, I can't work. Um, I can't work full time. I don't, you know, I don't want to work full time and I couldn't yeah. find daycare. And there was like this a whole, there was a whole slew of things. I actually didn't, I actually started Seniors Flourish honestly because I thought I was going crazy being at home and not getting any social interaction <laughs> and I felt like you know like my clinical skills were going to go to mush and so I was like I'm just going to get them out on paper or paper <laughs> see mm -hmm. how old school I am um <laughs> get it out I'm just going to get it out there and then it just kind of grew and it turned into you know the podcast and the membership site and everything else that it mm. is now but um it you have to see like you said find where your passions are and what really what your fat what's important to you because like yeah I, there's no way i could do a traveling job even though it would sound really exciting yeah 
Yes. Well, and it's not really exciting because it's so different than what I'm doing, you know, yeah. or was doing or whatever. And you'd be like, ooh, that's not like I get to travel around and I don't know or whatever yes. it may be. Because um, I think sometimes people are just like kind of get really desperate and they're kind of a bit grasping for straws a little bit. Yes. They're like, oh, that sounds great. Yes. I can do that. But like you say, it's not just your clinical, it's your things that are important to you. So I, I can see how those assessments, or those, that little battery of evaluation would be really helpful um, yeah. to kind of pinpoint. It's, because I feel like when you're kind of burnt out and you want to change, mm-hmm. like everything sounds awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what ends up happening is I've, I've found a lot of people who contact me, they've been at it for, some of them have been at it for over a year. And they're like, I have sent out hundreds of days and nobody to me. And it's interesting because for a lot of them, I think that these companies, one, they're going to, the vast majority of resumes are going to get thrown away if you don't format them specifically for the job with the right keywords and the right, the right, basically language Mm -hmm. that's listed in the job posting. And so a lot of times people don't even realize that that's a thing that it's called the applicant tracking system ATS, but most hiring managers use the software. And so most resumes that go through, if you haven't taken your resume and adjusted it for the job, your cover letter is great. No one's ever going to read your cover letter if your resume doesn't make it through. And so, Mm -hmm. so that's an interesting aspect of it is a lot of people have sent out like hundreds of resumes and they don't even know what they want to do because it's been so many, it's that feeling of desperation for a year, two years. And they say, I'll do anything. Mm -hmm. And I want to, I want to say, oh my gosh, you don't have to do anything. You can, (laughs) there's so much that you can do and you can probably even, if you do it strategically, you might even be able to get a, a pay raise and more flexibility and all of these aspects to your life that you want to address. You can you can absolutely fix those and improve those, but you have to be super strategic about it and you have to, one, I mean, you have to have a plan. You have to know what you're gunning for and two, you have to get what's missing if you don't have those things. So if you really want to go be a clinical informat- informatics OTPT or SLV, basically, then you're probably going to need a little bit more education. And but it's not like you have to go back for another bachelor's degree or another right. master's degree. So I, I think a lot of it is just you know knowledge is power. So for a lot of people, it's just it's just sharing with them you can do any of these things. You just have to decide one, what do you want to do, and then two, set your plan. How are you going to get there? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm passionate about the topic. I kind of want to give you a high five right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Where's my soba? So, how do you start exploring? How do you start exploring and looking at the different options out there? Or what, what? What are some things? So, you talked about getting your resume together, getting the right words, and that kind of thing. But like, I feel like people just don't know where to start. Is there? Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think in general, well, and Sarah's website is a great place to start for OTs because there are a number of articles on there on OT Potential where there's one for for OTAs kind of where you can go and there are a number of non-clinical paths on there or some of them I like to call them kind of semi-clinical where it might be a seating, what's it called, an assistive technology professional and then there's yeah. a seating and mobility specialist and so those ones are yeah you're still working with patients but it's outside of that traditional grind of you have to see x amount of patients per day and I might be speaking out of turn some of those jobs probably still have some quotas and productivity expectations but I still consider them pretty non-traditional and then um, she has the whole article about non-traditional jobs for occupational therapists where there are just a ton of different opportunities. So if you're speaking specifically for OTs, I mm-hmm. think that's a really great place to start because it's just a, a complete overview. And then I have a similar one on the non-clinical PT that's top, P, top clinical jobs for PT. And I want to create one for SLPs as well. And And so those are always just really easy place to start because it's an overview. And then if you really want to start digging deeper, then um, you can reach out to either one of us via social media, that type of thing. And then I have a course coming out in January that's called Non-Clinical 101. And it's basically just going to go through the four-step process of, you know, identifying what you want out of life and identifying what you want out of your career and that type of thing. And then the different currently 14, but I'm going to keep expanding it. And so all the different career paths to take and then making a plan and then the interview process, getting there, being successful. So that's kind of how to explore things 
generally speaking, I would say start start with the article, start with otpotential.com, her article. If you're a PT, go to my article and then go from there. If you're thinking, ooh, this sounds exciting, then you can kind of take steps from from there. And Sarah, do you have anything to add with that one? Yeah, I'm, I really like the questions that we have on that blog post um, related to this early stage um, because they're questions that I remember asking myself. Um, and some of them are just like, can you earn less money? Um, because mm. that will right away, like eliminate a certain number of jobs. Um, mm. Can totally. you <laughs> having a gap in pay yeah. where you're like building the skill set or going after those um, jobs really hard? Cause that will eliminate a certain number of jobs. Can you move? Um, do you have a front time and money to invest in a new skill set? Um, and my favorite was, are you okay starting small? Is there something um, that you can start doing in the evenings? Um, and I guess just like hustling mm -hmm. uh, where you may not make money initially. Um, what, do you have an example of something that that would, do you have an example of that? The starting small one? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think of probably you and I, Mandy, probably oh, yeah. fit in Good that yeah. um, where I was working full time. Um, and for me, working on my website wasn't even that I didn't like patient care. Um, me too. I feel, <laughs> yeah, I feel like I love patient care um, and still do and want to go back to it. But I felt this pull and this passion to also be doing this other thing. Um, and that I was just doing in, um, the evenings and when I wasn't working and I found that it was meeting a need and it just kept growing and growing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, yeah, no, you're right. I, I, I was, I didn't even think about myself in that situation, <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's exactly right. Just kind of start on the weekends and just seeing where it goes. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and like you say, it, <sighs> It's not like when you start these small things, it's a money maker, right? It's like no. it's it, it, it's a it's a it's a, a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah, so yeah. I think that's a and good that's way. Like the passion part comes in too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it like, like um, I would love for this to be an income replacing thing, but am I okay investing my time um, in it, even if it's not? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because yes, that's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> we're all we're all like, mm -hmm. yep, yep, <laughs> it's yep. True though. And honestly, every every move that I've made um, with re with growing websites, because I've now done these these two ones, has been like that. I've always had a job, my kind of day job, where I'm slugging along. And um, unlike you guys, I didn't love patient care, but mm -hmm. I I didn't hate it. That was the funny thing. People were always like, "Oh, you must have hated it." And no, I didn't hate it. I just, I just didn't, I found it very draining. Mm -hmm. And so, so I was just thinking, oh, I don't know if I could do this for my whole life, that kind of deal until I, until I uh, retire. But it was the same thing. And both of the times that I launched these websites, I had other full-time jobs and these things were hundred percent just passion projects thinking, oh, um, in fact, the first time was new grad physical therapy. I thought this is, this probably won't, uh, I don't want to go on record saying this, but I wasn't <laughs> sure it would become anything because I'd never really done any writing. And other than just for fun and, you know, like a little bit here and there, I'd kind of helped friends edit essays, that kind of thing. Yeah. But um, I, I just wasn't sure it would become anything. And then when it did, it was this big surprise. And so then with non-clinical, I was going, okay, well, this is just going to be a resource for people. I was working full time as a copywriter at that point. And, um, and when you when you take the entrepreneur route, I think that's probably appropriate for a lot of people who either need their health care through their through their jobs. I have a lot of people reaching out who say, I am the sole breadwinner. We get the benefits through my job. What else can I do? And I usually I usually try to identify if there's something they can jump right in. There's I either say it's like the plunge or kind of the career ombre or the, the gradual transition out. Yeah. That, that is my term. Someone else gave it to me, but I just thought that was funny. <laughs> but you either do the just a plunge and you, you jump into, a, say, a compliance full-time role or you slowly transition out. And that works better for careers. Like you guys were saying, you know, all three of us have kind of done the transition route where we gradually 
a site and as that becomes more and more of an influence, I guess, in our lives, then we're able to step away from patient care. But for other people, they, you know, if they don't want to be an entrepreneur, there are still other ways that you can do that sort of transition out where you gradually start doing other things. So writing works really well for that. Consulting works really well for that. Telehealth works really well. So you're just picking up a couple hours here and there on top of your normal job. Then you can just make that gradual transition without having to go, oh my gosh, what if I take this plunge? And then I hate it. And then yeah. with benefits and I take a pay cut or so. Anyway, that was me rambling again. <laughs> Ramble away. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think, I think, that's exactly right. It, it It is funny when you kind of look back on your journey and the paths. I mean, like I said, we were talking about we're non, you know, technically non-clinical, non-traditional roles. And so it's like how it all evolves so differently for everyone and what, what your needs are. And so I think ans- asking those questions, like you were saying, Sarah, like, can you, can you, uh, you know, take a pay cut? Can you start small? Can you do all these things? It kind of helps weed out and or find your path a little bit easier. Mm-hmm. That's why the blog post, and I'll add the blog posts and all these things that we're referencing in the show notes as well. But it's also great to, I think, connect with other non-clinical professionals. I think at one, it gives people kind of a little bit of hope that it can be done. Um, yeah. And also just maybe some support. So what are some area or how, how can people connect with other non-clinical professionals? Probably the biggest OT pool out there would be, this is one of my own groups, not to be self-promoting. <laughs> Um, so like, well, the it's OT a entrepreneurs right? group um, on Facebook, mm-hmm. which um, I just love that group because there are lots of OTs doing really inspiring things. Um, I guess not just non-clinical roles, but also um, starting niche businesses mm-hmm. uh, for OT, which um, I think there's a lot of overlap in that journey and that path uh, mm-hmm. for people. Um, But then there's also uh, bigger rehab, just like general rehab groups out there um, on Facebook. Meredith, what are the names of those? Uh, One is yours. Oh, so basically there are two different groups. One of them is called um, Non-Clinical PT Connections, but I really need to rename it because it's for every rehab professional. So it's basically Non-Clinical Connections, and it's... But, but look it up under non-clinical PT connections. It is on Facebook and it's got about 2000 people and quite a few of them actually already don't work in patient care. So that's a great place to network. And one of the things we kind of touched on earlier was those beginning phases of what do you do when you're in the extension phase? And I always encourage people to do informational interviews whenever possible. And so like Sarah was saying, go into the entrepreneurs group. If you're considering entrepreneurship, the OT entrepreneurs group, you can set up interviews with people and they generally generally speaking people are always willing to share their sort of path to getting where they got and then same thing so that's why I created non-clinical PT connections and then I have another group that actually is where people can just straight up look for jobs and it's called non-clinical job postings for rehab professionals and that one's got like 3,300 people or something crazy in it right now and I try to post three jobs per day every weekday um, that I find ones wow. that look good. So yeah, there'll be ones telehealth sometimes pops up, but sometimes there'll be rehab liaison, clinical liaison, utilization reviewer, mm-hmm. compliance professionals. And I try to find ones that don't really require additional education because I know that the vast majority of people in that group are not necessarily looking to go and take a whole nother thousands of dollars worth of <laughs> educational path. And, um, but then, but then that's, that's what brings me to, there's also a third group out there called Alternative Career Group. Uh, we call it ACG. For rehab? I think it, yeah, it's Alternative Careers for Rehabilitation Professionals, I think. I, I can double check because I want to give you the right name. But it's also on Facebook and it's an enormous group. It's got like 5,000 plus people. Oh, wow. And that job, what makes that one a little bit different, let me just look up the Alternative Careers for Rehabilitation Professionals. Okay. So what makes that one different is that that one tends to have more people who want out of healthcare altogether. Okay. So if somebody is, and there are a good amount of people who are like, I am done with healthcare. Yeah. <laughs> and they just don't want to, they just do not want to ever look at a hospital again. And that's totally understandable. So if someone is saying, I want to be, like Sarah said, a flute player, um, <laughs> that's a really good place. To that go. is a good place. For I you. love this example. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's where you will get the support and you'll, you'll end up finding people who chances are have done something similar where they, you get people who've gone into real estate, you get people who've gone into straight up marketing. And so I think it depends. It's a good idea to belong to all the groups. I think because if you want to be an entrepreneur and you're an OT, obviously mm -hmm. OT entrepreneurs, if you want to be, if you're not sure what you want to do, then alternative careers group is great. The alternative careers for rehab professionals. If you're quite sure you want to leverage your degree and say, I really want to stay in healthcare. I just want to go into a role that I don't really touch patients directly or use my body as much, but I want to be in impactful positions. Definitely join non-clinical PT connections. I know there's even one out there for SLPs and I, it's run by the same woman who started the Alternative Careers for Rehabilitation Professionals. Oh, okay. And it's got a huge following, and I don't think I'm in that one, but while you guys are chatting, I'll look it up, and then I can get to you for the <laughs> show. <laughs> well, it's just nice to be able to connect with other people when you're, I mean, let it be entrepreneur, as in, like, starting your own business, non-traditional, um, or something completely different, because you do kind of feel alone. And then you go do, and a lot of times if you mm -hmm. join, join some of these, you know, um, rehab Facebook groups, I mean, there's pros and cons to all these things, right? Like some people talk about how much they can't stand therapy. And then some people talk about how much they love it. And then you feel like, where do, where do I fit in? So it's nice to have some of these groups to have some different options out there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, so what do you I totally like personal note? Like I met Meredith in one of those, um, groups and that has just like breathed new life into my business um having a collaborator like that and it's so inspiring I met Mandy through a Facebook yeah I don't really remember exactly how but it's I been know a long time Facebook. actually yes. now yes <laughs> years years we've known each other no but we did we met yes. through a Facebook group so there well too so yes it's, it's crazy I, I am always blown away of how you can actually meet people on social media <laughs> Yes. And I even tell my husband sometimes, like, my, some of my good friends, I think, are people I have never met or maybe have met once at a conference. And it's crazy because you have these shared, you have these shared struggles and triumphs and things like that when you work remotely or you work in a non-traditional business that I think people only really get it when they're doing the same thing. And that's why I love the, o I love the different OT entrepreneurs groups and just the different masterminds and things like that because mm -hmm. I think it's just such a great way to to find camaraderie and support and then you really start becoming legitimately good friends with these people. So. <laughs> I know. <laughs> awesome. I know it. <laughs> so let's talk about like some specific examples. So people are, you know, let's say they are like, okay, I'm ready to take the plunge. I've done all of the Meredith's assessments. I know, <laughs> I know what I need to do. I looked at Sarah's examples on her blog post saying like, yes, I can take a, a job or a pay cut or I'm kind of just ready to explore. So what are some... Um, maybe non-clinical OT jobs that are maybe options for people. Meredith, I wonder if we should just like read through the 14 and then maybe choose like one or two to talk about. Does oh, that sound good? Sure. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Do you want me to just kind of run through them? I, yeah. <clears throat> so for these are the ones that I go over in – my course pretty extensively and then were, were you talking about the article or the course uh i feel like there's overlap there's, there's whatever you think yeah, yeah. Like there's kind of some okay. overlap so i think i mean i think it's just people are just kind of interested in saying like okay yeah i yes yeah. this is something i'm really interested in i would love to use my clinical skills because i have a lot of education and a lot of really valuable oh yeah things. so but what sure. are some types of jobs that people um i'm gonna touch are on applicable I'm going to touch on the most common ones instead of going through all 14 because some of them, there's overlap within those. Okay. Um, so, so, for example, one of them is account manager, but you can that kind of falls under sales and recruiter too. So okay. basically the big ones I would say are rehab liaison and OTs and PTs can both do that as well as SLPs. And <clears throat> sometimes assistants can do that, sometimes not, just depending on the facility. And then there's clinical trainer and I'm just kind of scrolling as we talk. Um Content writer is a big one where pretty much anyone can do that one if they want to. Then educator, meaning instructor or professor. There's health coach, which that one is one of the ones that I think Sarah's battery of questions is really important because that a lot of times there's a um, 
pay cut associated with becoming a health coach. And some places actually expect you to get additional training, even though we're already pretty highly educated. So it's an interesting path. Health informatics specialist or clinical informatics specialist, that's a huge one that I think way more of us should be going into, especially the, those of us who have really scientific or analytical minds. I say those of us. I should say those of you out there. Because <laughs> what is I don't that? have one of those minds. <laughs> I don't know and what that I is. Have, I don't know what that is. Oh, yeah, clinical informatics is really interesting. It's basically the the implementation of information science into healthcare. So, you know, you'll sometimes, and, and here's where there's a little bit of overlap with clinical trainers. So a lot of these jobs, there's a lot of gray area between them. But for informatics, you're basically the person who says, okay, we've got to upgrade our system. We've got to upgrade our Epic to the next version. It's being oh. released in July. And we've got to push this thing out by September because in October, there's this big other thing that's pushing out. And so we can't have the two co conflicting um, softwares fighting at the same time. So your job is to kind of look at the big picture of these health systems and saying, when should we push out software updates? But it's bigger than that. That's a good example of it. Mm -hmm. But there are also people, there's kind of a subset of that called clinical documentation improvement specialists. And those people, they do make a little bit less on average, but that's more of kind of almost an auditing role where you're looking at different documentation and saying, does this meet criteria for various payers? Does this meet criteria for inputting into our electronic system? So if you're looking at paper documentation, you would say, is this going to actually translate well into our electronic system? So there are all these different things you can do even within that subset of informatics. Informatics mm. does often require a bit extra training. So you can either go the route of getting an additional B BA or BS or and master's degree, but you can also go to a lot of local universities. They have those extended studies programs, and some of them have them online. So you don't necessarily have to live in Berkeley to go to Berkeley's program if it's online. Mm. And so that's one that I think the reason that I spend a lot of time on that one is I think there are so many opportunities for us because we, as OTs and PTs, we're extremely user focused. And so we always look at things from how is this going to affect the user? How is this going to make people? We're just always looking at things from a user lens. And so they have a lot of nurses in these roles and doctors in these roles. And they even will sometimes call these roles nurse informaticists or nurse informatics specialist. And they really want to focus on getting nurses in these roles. But I definitely think that more therapists need to be in the roles because just because we have such a background of setting goals and reaching goals and we tend to be very methodical and then we are so user focused. So I'm always encouraging people, if you have the desire to to take a little bit more education and you're not going to spend a ton, but just to take a little bit more education, it's a perfect role um, where it's like a blue ocean and there aren't many therapists in there and there aren't many people in general doing it yet. So that was just kind of my side note. And then I go I can see that being like, like a growing, I mean, all these I can see as being like growing um, professions too. Yeah, oh, um, definitely. That there's just need for these people, especially coming from like a clinical background. Yes, yes. And I think that, I think that you just hit something when you said growing, um, definitely growing in terms of job security because for a lot of us as clinicians we are spoiled by the idea that we can go anywhere we want generally speaking there are exceptions but anywhere we want generally we're going to be able to find some sort of work using our degree and so there are other fields where I didn't include in my first iteration of this course I did not include diabetes educator mm -hmm. which is technically a subset of clinical trainer anyway but I didn't include it because there just aren't that many roles and then in quite a few instances you will try to apply for a, a diabetes educator role. And even though you can serve that role as an OT or PT, we are technically allowed to have those roles. In many cases, nurses unions have set it so that only RNs are required or, or accepted. It's basically saying an RN is required to do this role. And so I don't want to encourage people to go for a role and spend all this time, money, education, pursuing something and then there just aren't the jobs out there so that's one angle to look at it from and then the other one is once you're in that role is their growth and so that's what you were saying Sarah there's a lot of growth with with clin clinical informatics and a hundred percent there is so much growth there's so much opportunity mm -hmm. for leadership because it's that it's that juncture where where clinical care meets technology and meets IT even in some ways and so for a lot of people I speak with, they're like, oh, I have a way back history of IT, but 
there's no way I can use that. Oh my gosh, yes, you can. Mm-hmm. And, and you can take that and you can leverage the two of them together and really build a satisfying career in informatics. And even if you don't have the IT background and you just take a little bit of education to get yourself up to speed, then you can grow so much in those careers. There's a, and without the, the glass ceiling that a lot of us face with our income with as therapists, you know, they're generally it's like you can make more money until you can't see any more patients. And then if you, <laughs> if you've talked, you can safely or physically see in a day, that's pretty much how much you're going to make as a therapist, which is very frustrating for people who are type three on the Enneagram, the achiever, because they are geared toward really kind of constantly growing and constantly improving themselves. So I think that that clinical informa- sorry, a clinical informatics specialist slash health informatics specialist is great for someone who's kind of an achiever type because there's limitless growth. And same with same with the next path I was going to go into and cut me off at any time because I'm kind of rambling again. <laughs> but there's management and leadership is another great one. Um, but that one's more traditional. People think about management, but um but sometimes we get sucked back into patient care in those roles. Mm-hmm. So, so that's it's the double-edged sword. You have to kind of have a plan of attack when you go into that. There's another one called program manager where it, that one's a little bit harder to get into. It's more about connections. But kind of going back to what we were saying, making connections, networking with others, pretty much any job you pursue, you want to have ne- you want to have connections. You want to network. You want to know someone in the companies that you're targeting for your job search because it just helps you get in front of the right person and it helps – helps paint the story behind you where let's say you want to become a recruiter. If you have a connection at a local recruiting or staffing firm, you're going to, you're going to stand out more as weirdo OT or PT just hates patients and wants to be a recruiter. That's kind of what your story might by default sound like to the hiring manager. If you just kind of submit your resume and it happens to make it through the ATS and then the recruiter sees it and you're like, yeah, I'm ready for a change. Then they might go, what's going on with this person? But if you know someone at that company, even if it's just through LinkedIn and you can give them a little heads up and say, I've been following you guys for years or, or months. And I really like what you're doing. And I've worked with some of the people you've staffed at my facility. And I just love your recruiting process. If you can flatter them and butter them up a little bit. Mm. And then when it's time to apply for a position, you actually have some, I'm trying to think of the right word, but it's, you, you have kind of a, a path, I guess. A little bit and of clout, say, yeah. yeah. Yeah, a little bit of clout, exactly. So you've applied, you're sending your resume, you're sending your cover letter, and then you can ping that person at the company, even if you don't know them very well, but just say, hey, I just wanted to let you know I sent in a, an application for this position. If you know anybody on that team by any chance, can you just let them get, give them the heads up that I'm applying and that um, I'm just really passionate about this role? That goes so far, just knowing someone on the team. And then a lot of people do push back and they say, well, I don't know anybody on the team, but that's where we come back to networking. And that's where you just have to reach out via LinkedIn. You have to reach out via these networking groups on Facebook and look at who you know in common, even on Facebook and ask for introductions. And then that helps so much with the networking component. And that's kind of true of traditional and non-traditional jobs too. Um, Mm -hmm. I know that, I used like a similar strategy to get a mental health uh, OT position that mm-hmm. I wanted um, and just like connected with someone who wasn't even in the rehab department there. Um, and that went a long way in helping me to get that role. Oh, oh absolutely. Good absolutely. one, Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true though. Well, I mean, it- and people feel guilty about it and they say, oh, I got everywhere I've gotten, I've gotten without connections. But then a lot of times I'm going, yeah, but you're miserable. Yeah. So <laughs> not to say that you can't, I mean, a hundred percent, you can get places. I know so many people who have landed incredible roles without any sort of connections. And I, I just know a lot of people out there who've done that. But when you're talking about changing careers and even with what Sarah was saying, you know, you went into mental health, which and, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not an OT, but from what I understand, it can be kind of hard to break into mental health if you haven't gotten the right clinicals and you weren't kind of lucky enough to stumble into it early on. Yeah, there's definitely less jobs. Out yeah, there. exactly. And so I think that for a lot of people, you know, if you don't get lucky for whatever reason, if you if you don't live in a city where there are very many, you have to use connections. And there's there's nothing wrong with connections. I mean, life is about connections. Everything mm-hmm. we do is about so 
Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to throw out two more uh, kind of job titles that I don't think you mentioned, Meredith. One was just a home safety professional. Yes. I see quite a few um, people in our group that have businesses that focus on that. Um, and then also, I don't think this is in our article, but I see a subset of people who um, work for rehab technology startups, um, yes. which is definitely a riskier route to take. Um, but I also see people being really fulfilled, um, the right person being really fulfilled in that role because um, yes. it's really exciting, um, lots of potential growth opportunities. Um, and we definitely, on our blog post, we have a couple people spotlighted who are thriving in roles like that. So OTs definitely do get those roles. They're wanted on those teams, on those uh, virtual reality, uh, mm -hmm. rehab technologies, and robot-assisted therapy. Mm -hmm. um, those companies want that clinical input. Uh, they want OTs on that team. Um, and it's definitely harder to get those jobs, but they're out there. Yeah. Definitely. Well, and um, Lauren, who you highlighted on the blog post, but also she did a podcast. So if you guys haven't listened, she talks all oh, about yeah. virtu virtual reality um, in neuro rehab. So that's one of the Ooh. early Seniors Flourish yeah. podcasts. Yeah, but that one out. that's it's so neat, like her story and how she kind of broke into that and her how she loves it and the passion for it. I love that. Yeah. So yeah. when she was really after that job, I right? know, I mean, she, you know, she, well, you'll have, you'll have to listen to the podcast, yes. everyone. <laughs> no, but basically, you know, she had a patient that was kind of looking into it, her fan, the, the wife or something. And then she kind of just started exploring and just saying like, this is awesome. So just kind of mm -hmm. pursuing a job to that. Well, okay. So, so we've kind of went through some of the examples and that there's actually more opportunities. I think that, that you can use your clinical skills. And I think sometimes people realize, cause I, you're like, I don't know how to use my, my actually use my clinical skills, but where do you find jobs like this? Like how, how do you, yeah. how do you go about looking for them? Yeah. So, that's a really common question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely the first place to start is just the same in the easiest is just the same places that you look for those traditional jobs. Um, and it's just kind of about searching for these different job titles um, so I'm thinking of like Indeed, mm -hmm. um, and ZipRecruiter, mm -hmm. um, and those big job boards, that's kind of like your first layer probably, um, is just to see if there's anything obvious that's in, um, the location that you're looking for. Um, Meredith and I also worked on a blog post called find, um, the right OT job. And in that post, we kind of list out every avenue that you can look for a job so that I think would be a good place if you um, have kind of zeroed in on a uh, position a type of position that you want to just go through look at the AOTA job board look at uh, does your state association have something does indeed have something mm -hmm. um, and it really is just and just like a traditional job just the work of going through all the different options because sometimes things are cross-posted and sometimes they're not Definitely. Mm. And I think that you want to have a list of different sort of alternative names for the same job because uh, one that I didn't I didn't mention yet, but Utilization Reviewer is huge for both OTs and PTs and PTs, but it's where you go through people's, you basically are doing either pre-authorizations for therapy or unfortunately denials, but um, but it's a pretty fulfilling job just depending on what your personality is. And mm -hmm. so... So for utilization review, there are all these different names for it. So it might come up under utilization manager or PPS coordinator, appeals coordinator, coding specialist, util utilization mm. management, chart reviewer. And so so I think kind of what Sarah was saying with when you go to Indeed and you're looking at this blank search engine, <laughs> it's a good <laughs> idea if you can to just have your little list of all the different names that the job would maybe be classified under. And then especially just a little like hot tip for, um, for utilization review, especially in things like recruiting is um, you want to put the, an additional word on there. So let's say you want to be a recruiter, but you don't want every single recruiting job to come up for like 
financial or something, mm -hmm. then you just add therapy or physical therapy or occupational therapy. And same with utilization reviewers. So you could put chart reviewer um, and then space PT or space physical or space occupational. And a lot of times then that'll bring up a really refined group of jobs that are actually going to consider therapists versus ones that only consider nurses. And you can also set job alerts on most of these places as well. So you can do that on glassdoor.com. I really love Glassdoor. And I think we talk about it in the article that we wrote, Sarah. Um, but Glassdoor is really cool because you can look up a lot of information about the company while you're on there. And then you can look at reviews. Although another kind of pro tip, if all the reviews that are glowing for the company were written like on the same day or two. <laughs> <laughs> and also if all the bad reviews are, um, are like one star and they're really hateful, then that could be the same person using multiple accounts to, to sort of blame the company. So just kind of keep an eye out with that. But I love Glassdoor and Indeed and LinkedIn. And you can set job alerts on all of these. And then also Sarah had mentioned earlier the startup jobs and a really great place to find those is angel list and i believe it's angel.co and -L dot yeah angel.co and it's it's basically just a startup job board and so it's cool because with that one if you just say i know i want to work at a start at a startup but i don't know what i want to do you can actually just go log in and then put into the search engine your your title so occupational therapist or occupational therapy and then it'll come up with all the different jobs so if you feel t feel like taking a completely different approach and saying i don't know much but i know i want to work at a startup then <laughs> <laughs> i wanted to sing it like don't know much <laughs> you, know, you want to work at a startup and put that into the job into the search engine occupational therapist or physical therapist and then it'll just spit out all the different places that are hiring for you. So that's another approach you can take that doesn't necessarily work on Indeed or any of those other engines. Because if you were to put occupational therapist into Indeed, you're going to get all clinical jobs. But with, with the startup world, with AngelList, you're not really, clinics don't really list their jobs on there. So, wow. I want to highlight the biggest asset that all OTs have too, which OTs are so nice we have such so nice wonderful it's like <laughs> Meredith and I talk about this all the time to the point where it's almost a joke to us because they are just so nice so like nice. Yeah. and you uh, have this incredible network out there even if it's just the people that you know from school um and I would absolutely start every job search with just emailing every OT that you know that might be vaguely related to what kind of job you're looking for, whether they're just in like the city you want to be in or if they're in the same field and just let them know that you're looking mm -hmm. um, because that network is so powerful and we're so lucky to be in a profession where um, we tend to have each other's backs and want to help each other find great jobs. Um, and that is unique. So yeah. definitely take yes. advantage. That. Amen. And and I mean, I am curious because because I think I, I love OTs. They've always been my favorite. Everywhere I work, I'm, <laughs> my closest friends always end up being the OTs. And I've always wondered because, to be perfectly honest, when I left patient care, I got a lot of weird vibes from people. Sometimes people were straight up rude, and they would say things. And this this is coming from PTs. So they would say things <laughs> like, "Oh, you're wasting your degree," or "Oh, Not you're." Right. Um, yeah, or didn't you, did you hate patients or did you hate patient care? That's the one that I get a lot. And sometimes I'm like, you just want to hear me say that I hated patient care, don't you? <laughs> so, but anyway, they, it's it's just interesting the response that I think you would get. I think that was a that's a total pro tip for OTs that maybe I'm not sure if PTs are maybe we're pr a bit proud sometimes or maybe there just isn't that sort of teamwork approach as far as leaving patient care. But if an OT were to say, I want to do something else, yes, work your network. My my recommendation for anybody though, PT or OT, would be to have your your story thought through. So instead of just being like, I need something that's not patient care quick now. <laughs> which mm -hmm. is what a lot of people come out to me saying they're like, help. And and I want to say don't sound desperate. Just say I've been treating now for three years or six years or eight years, and I'm coming to a point in my life where I'm really looking for a change. It's all about how you explain your desire to do something else. Um, 
and so I, I feel bad because now I feel like I was shaming PTs, but no, <laughs> not. I come off that way. We love but, PTs too. Yeah, I love PTs too. But uh, basically, whether you're reaching out to a network of of loving OTs and supportive OTs, or a network of PTs who are loving or not, just depending on who you're reaching out to, I think it's important to kind of note note that you are looking for a change for X, Y, Z reasons. And you, you just have to kind of paint your story in a way where you don't sound like you don't want to work. It's not like, oh, sometimes people say, oh, it's this productivity is killing me. And, it, and I want to say, well, you're going to go into another job and you're going to have to, even if you're a writer, you have to have like three articles written a day. Mm-hmm. Or if you're a um, utilization reviewer, you're going to have to have X amount of charts reviewed by this day sometimes, in certain jobs. And so you really need to have your story written in a way that you sound excited and impassioned instead of somebody help me. <laughs> yeah. You use the word desperate and that just made me think yeah. too, like an OT should never have to feel shouldn't have to feel desperate when they're looking at these jobs. They should feel totally confident because I totally think that OTs have the skill set of the future, which is like thinking holistically, being great, like bridge builders and team players. And um, that is totally what works in healthcare. And that's what companies are going to be looking for. So um, just feel confident that you do have the skill set. And there are jobs out there for you. Definitely. Perfect. Oh. I know. I know. It's so, it's actually, I, I love talking about it because I think it's kind of one of those things like a lot of people are really curious, but they almost don't want to admit it. You know what I mean? They're almost like mm-hmm. you're saying, you almost don't want to admit that you're kind of looking for something different or, um, so it's really neat to see that there's a lot of resources out there. There's a lot of, um, groups and support out there. Um, and things like that. So that's amazing. Okay. So let's just kind of maybe wrap up. So Sarah, um, where can people find you? They, they can connect. find me at <laughs> otpotential.com or um, a nice way to start this conversation too is also on the Occupational Therapy Entrepreneurs Facebook group um, where you can crowdsource lots of different insights from uh, different OTs from, I guess, around the globe. Yeah, that's and I love that too. How about you, Meredith? How can people like find you or get in contact with you? Yeah, so... The nonclinicalpt.com is the website address, and you can find links to my two Facebook groups on the resources page. So if you just go to the nonclinicalpt.com and then click resources, you should be able to find links to the Facebook groups. And then as far as if you're curious to learn more about the course that I'm going to be putting out in January, then you can just go to nonclinical101.com and read a little bit more about what that involves. And then you can sign up for, for updates. Yes. So, and I'll yeah. put all the links and all the fun stuff um, in the show notes um, so everyone can get in contact with you and check out your course um, so that is exciting. Thank you guys Thank so you. much for uh, connecting with me and sharing your experience with the listeners today. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's great. I feel I, like we could just talk for like four more hours. Let's do it. <laughs> so I was like, is it over yet? I know. It goes <laughs> by <laughs> so fast. I know. Well, thanks again. And thanks everyone Thank for listening. You. Yeah. Do you feel like you're navigating the OT world without a map? Not feeling confident or competent in your day-to-day treatments and struggling to apply your knowledge clinically? Then be sure to check out the Seniors Flourish Learning Lab membership. It has all the treatment ideas, patient handouts, clinical resources, community support, and mentorship you need to succeed. Join today at SeniorsFlourish.com slash learning lab.